All right, so it looks like I may have been on mute that whole time. So let me try this again. Oh, wait. Looks like we are having technical difficulty. All right, well, hold on just a moment. We are definitely struggling in this moment. It looks like we have some technical difficulties. So what we're gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and run this just the way that it is. And hopefully someone will be able to uh, help us. Give me just a second. I'm gonna message my team because it looks like that we're, we're actually streaming to three communities right now. And it looks like both of our Facebook communities are having issues but we are able to be live on YouTube. So give me just a moment. All right. Well, that's quite a challenge to get started like that. Anyway, all right, so we're just going to go ahead and we're going to go and anybody else who is not able to join us can catch this on the replay. So hopefully we can get people there on the team to field any questions. All right, so again, my name is Shante Skildager and I am back with another week of our AMA series, which is Ask Me Anything. So if you are an aspiring instructional designer and you have questions about instructional design or maybe you're a brand new instructional designer, you've already gotten your job, maybe you're having imposter syndrome, maybe you just have some questions because you're not quite yet feeling confident in your new job, this is the place for you so that we can answer your questions. So any questions that you have, go ahead and send those my way. All right. So. To anyone that has to watch this later in our Facebook groups, I am so sorry that our links were broken, but those of you that are here live with us on YouTube, we are super excited that you are here. All right, so we do already have a few questions. If you would like to submit some questions, you can go into our Facebook group and I've got Gil and Sarah. They are both there ready to receive your questions. We are the instructional design hangout for aspiring instructional designers. So you can post your questions there. All right, let me just do one more thing and see if somebody can catch questions on YouTube and drop them here for me. All right, we'll see what happens. Well, it's a grand experiment today. All right, so we do have a few questions that were already submitted through our instructional hangout community, our Facebook community, our instructional design hangout community. So question number one says, I feel that there is so much talk these days that is geared towards authoring tools, but is there still a market for project roles or instructional design roles? So yes, absolutely, there is still a market for both of these things. I think it will depend on what your search is whenever you're searching on Indeed or Google or even LinkedIn. But yes, absolutely, there are still jobs in all these different areas. So what this person is talking about, the jobs being geared toward authoring tools, is related to the fact that you often hear people talk about storyline and rise and captivate and things like that. So yes, you're going to hear that because a lot of times those are the questions that people are asking in groups. And even whenever you go out to LinkedIn and you ask, or you're looking for jobs, you're going to see the authoring tools are listed there. But if you back it up inside of that job description, you're still going to see that they're looking for curriculum mapping, objectives, mapping outcomes, engaging experiences. So that all falls in our instructional design realm. It's just that now people often are looking for instructional designers who can do a little bit of everything, who can do the instructional design side of things, who can do the work in the authoring tools like Captivate and Storyline and other tools who can do videos. So yes, absolutely, there is still a market for an instructional designer 
just it's just that jobs are often looking for instructional designers who could do a little bit of everything. So you really want to broaden your skill set so that you can meet the demands of the work of the marketplace. And then this other question around project roles, this is really getting getting into like the project management side of things on an L&D team. And yes, absolutely, those roles exist too. You often don't see those in smaller organizations, though, because it, it, again, it's like that all-inclusive role in the sense of I wear the PM hat, I wear the ID hat, I wear the e-learning developer hat, I wear the, the LMS administrator hat. So the, all these jobs exist. You've just got to be clear in what your search is whenever you're out there searching and find the jobs that really appeal to what it is that you are looking for. Uh, and then there is another question that was related to this or connected to this question around is a PMP valuable anymore? If you haven't heard of a PMP, what that is, it's a certification in project management. So it's project management professional. So is it relevant? Yes, absolutely. If you are going into project management, you might even want to get an agile certification or some other certifications related to project management. But you do not need a PMP as an instructional designer. You need to know how to do project management. You need to understand how to scope your projects, how to manage your task, how to estimate your timelines, and how to stick within that timeline. But you are not required to have a PMP certification. So that is a really great question. And thank you so much for submitting it. All right. So next up, we've got how do I get started in instructional design? I am not a teacher. It's really interesting that somebody is connecting instructional design to I'm not a teacher. Most of the instructional designers that I know and have worked with in my career as an instructional designer and running L&D teams in big global companies, most of the instructional designers that I have met along the way were not teachers. Most of them did not have any kind of official background or academic background in instructional design. Instructional designers really come from all fields. So you don't need to be a teacher in order to pursue instructional design. I believe that the reason that this is coming up so much here lately is because there is a mass, um, a mass, I don't want to say evacuation, but that's not it, a mass exodus of teachers out of the classroom in the United States. And so you have around 300,000 teachers that are leaving the classroom every year and they're looking for other degree or sorry, other career options. And many of them are talking about instructional design or they're finding instructional design because there are some overlaps between teaching and instructional design. They're not perfect overlaps. One doesn't replace the other. You can't substitute teaching for instructional design or instructional design for teaching. So I think that's really why we're hearing so much of our conversation about this career focused on teachers, but you do not need to be a teacher. So your paths for instructional design could be that you self-study. You could go back to college and get another degree. You could go physically, you know, that traditional in class. You could take online classes. You can get a certificate program. Here at the Instructional Design Company, we offer an ID certificate program. You can, if you're lucky, maybe you can get on the job support to become an instructional designer. So maybe you already have a job and there's an L&D team and the members of that L&D team, specifically the hiring manager, already know what your work ethic is, already knows that you know a lot about the organization, has already seen you in action in the workplace. And maybe they want to invest in you and bring you on the team. And then you get on the job training, which could also be an option. So there are many ways for you to get started in instructional design. And you do not need to be a teacher. So let me make that clear. Instructional designers come from all paths, not just teaching paths. We just happen to be hearing a lot about teachers because of this big movement out of the classroom and this pursuit of a new career. All right. So if you have any questions around that, come talk to me, find me in the DMs, chat with me. Again, our community is the Instructional Design Hangout for aspiring instructional designers. And I would be glad to answer any questions that you have about pursuing some different paths. Now we can drop into the thread 
um, our five paths for pursuing instructional design. So we've got a video that covers these five different paths and gives you some guiding information about that. All right, so let's see, number three, what's the next question that we have? And again, if you have any questions, Sarah is on our YouTube channel right now, catching and looking for any potential questions. So this next question says, are instructional designers usually responsible for the look and feel of the trainings, or are there sometimes specific people responsible for the UI UX? So UI UX means user interface and user experience. Now, I cannot speak for every organization out there. The way that teams are set up really varies by organization, by company. I have been on teams where I was responsible for the instructional design. I'm going to just use an instructor-led experience as an example, and then I'll talk about e-learning. I have worked in an organization where our marketing department had very, very strict guidelines about all of our materials. And every single slide deck that we created for our instructor-led trainings and our virtual instructor-led trainings all had to use the template that was created by the marketing team. That means every slide came from a deck of 20. We could cycle through those 20 slides, but every single learning experience had the same look and feel. And then within that same organization, they had us build an e-learning template in Captivate that they approved of that we could use. And we had to use it for every single e-learning. So they created the base for our UI UX in the sense of like how it looked and how it felt. But we as instructional designers still worked within those tools. In some organizations, you might mock up slides and then you send them off to a design team and they develop those. Now, that's not the typical experience in every organization. A lot of times as instructional designers, we are responsible for it all. We'll do the instructional design, which means that we craft that learning experience. We write out what those scripts are going to be. We define what the engagement exercises are going to be, what the quiz questions will be, any kind of handouts that go with that. We'll design the slides and we'll design, like we'll do all that work. So this question, like who is responsible for the user interface and the user experience, it really, really depends on where you work. But definitely as instructional designers, we're gonna have a role in this no matter who has ultimate responsibility for it. So we're going to be crafting that experience, that learning experience, and then we may be partnering with someone to create the interface. But again, it just really depends on what the setup of your team is. For many of us, we're really doing it all. I know in our last AMA, somebody else also asked a question about user interface, user experience, and whether they needed a certificate for that. You don't, but you definitely want to be learning and absorbing, you know, looking at other people's examples, looking at examples online from stuff like communities like eLearning Brothers, what's out there in the storyline community, just to get a sense of what good design looks like. Take some courses yourself to get a good sense of what a good experience feels like so that you can bring some of those learnings and observations into the learning experiences that you create. All right, so number four, how should I ensure I stay relevant in the industry? I love this question because that means that you are already thinking ahead for our for your development, how you're going to continue to grow, how you're going to continue to evolve within this field of instructional design or in this larger field of LMD, which is learning and development. There are many ways that you can evolve. I am going to ATD in New Orleans this year. So after being an instructional designer now for many, many years, I'm still investing in my development. So I'll be in New Orleans. I'll be filling my calendar with a lot of different classes or workshops that I can go to so that I can continue to learn. I also invest and encourage you to invest in reading. You can you know, borrow books from people. You can purchase books on Amazon. 
You can, you know, get books for, you know, like a Kindle edition. So there's lots of ways for you to get development. You can also follow YouTube um, channels that talk about L&D. You can read blogs and different things like that. You can take online courses. So again, I mentioned earlier that we have an ID certificate program. So you can take certificate programs. You can take continuing education through different organizations like ATD. I know I mentioned that I was going to a conference, but they also have a local, uh, many communities have a local chapter of ATD that you can get plugged into. And they have m at least monthly education opportunities that you can plug into and workshops that are online that you can plug into for continued development. And then just pay attention to what's happening in the world in you know, learn in that way, because not everything is about the art of instructional design. As instructional designers, we need to have like a big, broad knowledge base of different things. Like AI is really, you know, at the top of mind right now because AI is showing up in every different way. So if I were you know, out there, well, I am. As an instructional designer who is looking at continued development, I am also looking at how I can develop my, my knowledge of AI, playing with new tools, exploring what are the new tools that are out there. I'm in some RSS feeds that are sending me updates about what's new and emerging in AI. So keeping up with that. Different topics. What are the important topics that are in our society? And reading and researching those. You know, what are topics that are interesting to me that I just want to learn for the sake of learning. So just keep all those things in mind that those are ways for you to continue to develop yourself, evolve and stay relevant in this industry. What you don't want to ever find yourself doing is like thinking from the perspective of, I already know everything I need to know, because as soon as you think that, you will be a dinosaur in no time. So we don't want that for you. So continue to grow, continue to learn, and continue to evolve. All right. So it looks like Gil has a couple of more questions here for me. Again, I would love to see questions for, from our channel if you have questions. So let's go ahead and get those out here dropped in, because I would love to answer any questions of anyone that is attending live. It's great to have questions from folks who have already pre-populated our question form. I love that, so I'm not knocking that. But I would also love to just engage a little bit with our community that is here live. And again, apologies to our two Facebook communities where our connection broke and we are not able to engage you right now. Okay, so this is a freelancing question. As a new freelancer, how do you determine rate and pay structure? How do you know if a project would be better off hourly or fixed? And this question is coming from Scott uh, from, from one of our communities. So this is a really great question. And unfortunately, there's not a one size fits all answer for this, but I will do my best to, to give you some guidance. So whenever you're thinking about your rate in your pay structure, you're going to want to check and see what is the market saying that it will pay for instructional designers based on your level. So there are different levels. You might be a brand new instructional designer. You might be an instructional designer with 20 years of experience. You might be an instructional designer with a very specific niche or skill set that other instructional designers might not have. So you will factor all those things in when selecting a price for yourself, an hourly rate that you want to um, charge for your services. So it really depends on where you are in your journey. But that's what, what I would suggest. I would suggest that you do some research. You can go out to Upwork. You can search for instructional designers in the United States or wherever you are. And you can see what the what instructional designers are asking as their hourly rate. Look at their experience. Have they been doing this for a while? How does that compare to yours? And then sometimes, like if you're just trying to break into the freelance world, you might want to adjust your rate a little bit less than what you would hope to be charging when you're a little bit more mature in your business. So you'll just have to make some adjustments for that. Now, the second part of this question, how do you know if a project would be better off as an hourly project or a fixed project? 
you know, even today as an instructional designer, we have a, we were, a, we're an instructional design professional services agency. That's what we do primarily. We build learning solutions for our clients. But even today, like there is, it's a question for me every time I start a new project with a new client, are we going to go hourly or are we going to go flat rate fixed project? If I am working with a client who is super, super clear about what their project is and what they need in that project, those are the kind of projects that I like to do a fixed flat rate on. So I, at the start of that project, we'll have some scoping meetings. I'll take the information that I collect from those scoping meetings. I will scope everything out. I will estimate how long it's going to take. I mean, everything. I have a line in a spreadsheet for every single task, how long I think that is, including the feedback and review cycles. So let's say, for example, that I create a participant workbook as a part of this project. There is literally time inside of my spreadsheet that says the review and the feedback edits that I'm going to get. And so I put that very clearly into my scope. And that's how I come up with my flat fee. And in my contract with the client, I'm very clear about what's included and what's not. And any change would require, would require us to put in a change request as a part of the contract to amend the contract. So if it's super clear, flat fee. If it's not super clear, or I'm working with a client who's really just kind of new to L&D, which you can kind of gauge based on your conversation. In those scenarios, I will move to an hourly rate because what I have found over the years is that whenever someone's not super familiar with L&D and how long things take, or they're not clear about their project, and I give them a price just based on those early conversations, and then they're trying to throw in four or five other things and I'm like, oh, sorry, we're going to have to change the price. We're going to have to change the price. We're going to have to change the price. Well, they feel like it's a bait, and, a bait and switch. Like I told them one price and then I keep elevating the price. So I have found that it's just easier for me to do an hourly rate in situations where people aren't super clear about what their project is. So I use both and you can use both, but maybe that might help guide your decision and how you are uh, choosing to move forward, whether that is flat fee or hourly rate, or maybe some sort of hybrid, depending on who the different clients are that you are working with. Okay, let's see. Looks like we might have a question here. For someone who is new to the field, very entry level. So this is from Happy Smiles. Thank you, Happy Smiles. For someone new to the field, very entry level, or considering looking into positions with similar tasks, not ready to go all in yet. What job titles should people look for? All right, so Happy Smiles, you can put this over here into the comments because I've got the comments thread open. But whenever you say that you are looking to, into positions with similar tasks, what are you talking about? Similar tasks that you're doing today in your current job or similar tasks to instructional design? If you are not ready to go all in into instructional design, I would want to know what your current career is so that I could really set you up well for this question and answer. Um, but if you're just looking for something that kind of like puts you on the fringe of instructional design or on the fringe of L&D, like you're in it, but you're not doing the instructional design role, you could look at coordinator roles, admin roles, specialist roles, so you could look at things like LMS admin or training coordinator or instructional design coordinator, instructional design specialist, things like that. So if you have a little bit more clarity around that, happy smiles, go ahead and drop that into the comments and the team will make sure that I see that. So that's a really great question. All right. So another question that we have here from Hamam. What qualities or skills do you believe define a professional instructional designer? Well, there are just so many. <laughs> there are so many. And you know what? Before I answer this question, because I'm going to give you the skills that I think are great, 
but just know that not everybody has every single great quality of an instructional designer. We can strive to have them. We can work towards them, but we're not always going to have everything. Okay. So number one, I would say you need to have a love of learning the ability to work autonomously because a lot of this work we do on our own even when we're paired up on a project team or with a subject matter expert we still do a lot of work on our own so we've got to have discipline in the ability the ability to work and be self-sufficient you also have to have the ability to research and figure things out on your own this is not a paint by numbers kind of career where you know, even if I give you the recipe for instructional design, like, hey, let's do the needs analysis, let's write our objectives, let's do an outline, let's, let's create a mind map and a script. Even if I were to give you a recipe, no one project is exactly the same as the next. No project team is exactly the same from project team to project team. I might have a super involved subject matter expert on one project, and one that I'm like trying to chase down and get information from on the next project. So, so you definitely have to be persistent. You have to have discipline. You've got to be able to figure things out and figure out how to, you know, kind of flex with whatever situation that you were in. I would say that it's also helpful to be kind of a systems thinker. And what I mean by that is to think about, okay, this one task, how does it influence the other parts of this project? So I often give the example of if I'm creating a video or I'm working on an e-learning project and there's going to be um, a voiceover or there's some kind of audio narration. Well, I need to back that up, right? I got to think about it from a systems perspective. Where does this need to happen in my process? in order to make sure that I have it ready by the time that I'm ready to sync up the audio with everything that's happening on the screen. So being a systems thinker is good, uh, enjoying working with others because you are going to work with others and kind of have a little bit of thick skin in the sense of this is a career with a lot of feedback and you're going to get a lot of feedback from different people. And for whatever reason, whenever we're working on learning, everybody has an opinion. Like you're going to get an opinion on everything. Like, why'd you choose that color for the button? Or I think you should scoot that button a little over here left, or maybe we should use this different image or this or that. So just be ready for feedback because we're going to get a lot of it as instructional designers. So the more comfortable you are with it, the better off you will be. All right, let's see if we have any other questions here before I go to this last one. We only have a couple of minutes. Sure is good that we had all these curated questions. So thank you, Gil, for organizing those up front. Okay, so this is a question about portfolios. What website do you recommend I host or build my instructional design portfolio on? Well, I'm all about free, so I would recommend you go out and find something that is free. There are a lot of really great instructional or a lot of great portfolio sites out there that you can use, um, but I would go with something free. So for example, in our ID certificate program, we encourage our students to use Google Sites so that they're not having to pay any kind of monthly fee in order to host that. Um, but there are other really great sites out there that you can pay some nominal fee for that will give you enhanced features. So I would just suggest that you do a Google search of top portfolios for a digital portfolio or an e-learning portfolio. It'll probably give you a list of anywhere from 10 to 20. Check out what those features are. Look for what you need. Assess what that price is and choose one of them. Um, they all pretty much have some of the same basic features. But then whenever you get into paid plans, you get some you get additional benefits. So just decide what you need and go with that. All right. So that is my last question. Again, to all of our folks in our Facebook community who didn't get to join us live, I am so sorry, but this replay will be available for our YouTube channel that was able to join us live. Well, we're so glad to have you here with us. Please ask any additional questions. Come find us in the Instructional Design Hangout for aspiring instructional designers. Send me a DM or find the thread where we will post this replay video and ask any questions there. Sarah and Gil, who are behind the scenes, thank you both for helping out and helping me try to figure out this 
technical challenge before at the start of this. So we'll be back in a few weeks in April. In April, we are doing a couple of things. We're going to have polls every Friday where we're going to be asking you about what it is that you need in, in your instructional design education. So again, these polls will be on Friday. They will be posted in our instructional design hangout Facebook community for aspiring instructional designers. So look for those polls there. Come put your input in so that we can start using that information to create additional sessions like this one. But in addition to our weekly polls and Q&A that's going to come out of that, we're also doing an event specifically for teachers around um, what would be helpful to know before making that transition out of the classroom into a career in instructional design. You'll find the details for that at um, instructionaldesigncompany.com or you'll find them inside the instructional, the instructional Design Hangout for Aspiring Instructional Designers. We'll see you soon. Thank you so much. And I'll be around. Come find me in the Hangout.